Now, with that background, I will turn it over to Martin and Tamby, who will present the case studies using WGS to investigate TB cluster alerts in California. Thank you, Sarah. My name is Martin Silnes, and I am an epidemiologist with the California Department of Public Health. I will be discussing a case study on how we use whole genome sequencing to investigate a TB cluster alert in California. Conventional genotyping methods are an important tool to identify and investigate genotyping clusters that might be outbreaks or transmission events. Sometimes our cluster investigations lead us to previously unknown and important outbreaks where intervention is feasible and warranted. We find the red cat, if you will, because conventional gene typing leads us to bark up the right tree. But there are limitations of conventional TB gene typing, and some of our cluster investigations lead to barking up the wrong tree, like the dog in this image, where we investigate genotype clusters of cases that might not be linked in a chain of transmission. Our talk will describe how WGS can help us make sure that we're barking up the right tree. This next slide shows some background about TB in California to provide some context for our talk. California reported more than 2,000 cases of TB in 2016, more than any other state in the U.S. When we look at why cases occur, there are three primary drivers of morbidity. The reactivation of infection acquired a long time ago is responsible for about 80% of cases. Importation of TB represents about 7% of the cases. Recent TB transmission within California is estimated to be responsible for about 13% of our cases. Our focus today is on recent transmission. So this next slide shows how WGS impacted TB outbreak work at a program level. In the past four years, we received 164 CDC TB genotype cluster alerts for California. We recently analyzed data from all of our TB outbreak investigations from 2013 to 2016, and for which we had WGS results. We used WGS on genotype clusters associated with 41 potential TB outbreaks. After considering WGS results, along with clinical and epi data, almost two-thirds of the clusters were confirmed as outbreaks. In many of these confirmed outbreaks, WGS helped us identify cases we could exclude from further investigation because their TB isolates were genetically distant from the outbreak case isolates and unlikely to be linked by recent transmission to the outbreak. Importantly, more than one-third were refuted as outbreaks. All 15 of the refuted outbreaks started as suspected outbreaks. These refuted outbreaks are examples where reliance on conventional TB genotyping would have led us to bark up the wrong tree. We and local partners would have spent precious time and resources looking for epi links between cases that did not exist. So now I'll talk about the case study one, uh, confirming outbreak in a high TB incense jurisdiction. So as background, we received a CDC TB genotype cluster alert for a genotype cluster in County A. When we examined this cluster more closely, we found that there were 13 California cases with a genotype and eight of them lived in County A. The remaining five cases were scattered across four other counties. We notified County A about the CDC alert. They were already aware of the six cases, six of these cases in their county that had known epi links. This was actually a confirmed outbreak involving a high school and two households. But we in County A were left with some unknowns. Are the two remaining cases in County A also part of the outbreak? Are the five California cases outside of County A part of the outbreak? Are any of the seven cases not part of the outbreak linked to each other in a separate chain of transmission? Where should we focus further work to interrupt TB transmission in this outbreak? To help answer these questions, we asked CDC to perform WGS on all 13 California isolates in the genotype cluster. So this next slide shows the phylogenetic tree and epi data. 
we receive the phylogenetic tree and then overlay epi and clinical data to help us interpret the tree. Eight cases shaded in blue were reported by County A. To the right of the MRCA are isolates from six cases, these are circled in red, that were already known by County A to be epidemiologically linked. WGS shows these isolates are genetically closely related to each other, meaning that the isolates are zero to two SNPs from each other. Here, WGS helped confirm an outbreak. Also, to the right of the MRCA is an isolate from a TB case with a possible epi link to County A. WGS shows a 10 SNP difference between this isolate and the outbreak isolates, which is a relatively large genetic distance. This suggests that this patient was not infected by any, any of the outbreak cases. To the left of the MRCA are six isolates, two of which are from cases reported by County A. The other four isolates are from individual cases scattered across several counties. After the clinic, clinical and epi data are added to the tree, we interpret the results. So let's think back to the unknowns we listed at the start of this investigation. Are the two remaining cases in County A also part of the outbreak? No, their TB isolates are genetically distant from the nearest outbreak cases by seven and 10 SNPs respectively. Are the five California cases outside of County, County A part of the outbreak? No, their isolates are genetically distant from the nearest outbreak isolate by six to 10 SNPs. Are any of the cases that aren't part of the outbreak linked to each other in a separate chain of recent transmission? No, their isolates are three to 14 SNPs from each other, and there is no strong epi or clinical data to suggest that they are linked. Where to focus further were to interrupt TB transmission? On the outbreak case contact investigations and to ensure that all appropriate contacts are found, evaluated, and if needed, treated. In this example, seven cases, the ones whose isolates are marked by an X could be excluded from the investigation based on genetic distance of seven to 10 SNPs from the outbreak cases and no previously identified strong epidemiologic links. Two of the cases we excluded from further investigation lived in County A. If not for WGS results, we likely would have been concerned that they were likely linked to the outbreak or to each other, and would have been barking up the wrong tree to look for links that did not exist. We had identified a case with a possible but weak epi link to County A. This is the isolate on the lower right that we could also cross off our list as needing further investigation in this outbreak. Excluding all the clustered cases outside of County A helped us avoid uh, what would have been a large and labor-intensive multi-jurisdictional outbreak investigation. But the story does not end there. Several months after the initial genotype cluster alert, another case from County A genotyped into the cluster. We notified County A about the new case in the alerted cluster. The County TB program did not know of any epilinks the new case had to any of the other cases in the genotype cluster. However, the case's TB skin test recently converted to positive after years of negative TB tests, suggesting that they recently acquired TB infection. WGS was performed on their TB isolate in a group together with the outbreak cases where the red arrow is pointed. The county is investigating if and or how the case is linked to the outbreak. So what are some of the public health outcomes of this investigation? Hopefully this case study il illustrated how WGS helped us to achieve some important public health outcomes and helped answer the final question we had at the start of the investigation. Where should we focus further efforts to interrupt further TB transmission? We were able to avoid unnecessary and resource intensive investigation of seven cases residing in several different counties. WGS results enabled continued focus on six cases linked by recent transmission. County A intensified work to identify, evaluate, and treat contacts to outbreak cases. Now I will turn it over to Tambi to talk about a second case study. Thanks, Martin. In the second case study, 
I'll describe how we use whole genome sequencing to help refute a TB outbreak in a low TB incidence jurisdiction. We first learned about a suspected outbreak when we received a CDC TB genotype cluster alert for four patients with matching TB genotypes diagnosed in an eight-month period in a rural county. This is a low TB morbidity jurisdiction that usually reports about 10 cases per year. TB genotype clusters are rare in the county. In addition, the genotype that alerted is rare in California and in the U.S. In the three years preceding the alert, there were only about 17 cases in the entire United States with this genotype. The more uncommon a genotype is, the more likely it is that clusters of cases with that genotype are likely linked by recent transmission. So the rarity of this TB genotype plus the clustering in time and place in a low morbidity TB jurisdiction were concerning for a possible outbreak. When we looked more closely at the surveillance data for the four patients, we saw that two of them were adult men with sputum smear positive TB and one had a cavitary chest x-ray. These are characteristics associated with more infectious forms of TB. Both of these patients were also reported to use drugs and this can present challenges for ensuring complete contact investigations. We also noted that two of the cases were in young U.S. born children. One was an infant and one was a five-year-old. By definition, TB in young children is a red flag for recent transmission. In short, this cluster looked very much like a TB outbreak. And the county public health staff were all relatively new to working in TB and were juggling multiple responsibilities. When we contacted the county TB program, we learned their contact investigations of the adult patients had identified some epidemiologic links. County staff knew that patient one, an adult male, was a likely source case to pediatric patients two and three. The dark lines represent definite epi and transmission links. They also knew that patient four, an adult male, was a likely source case for a child with clinically diagnosed TB. So this left us with two groups of patients with epi links within each group, but no known links between the two groups. At that point, we had a five-person suspected TB outbreak. We also learned that the contact investigations for the infectious adult patients were challenging and that contact follow-up hadn't yet been completed. We offered on-site field assistance to support the county and the county agreed. We deployed a two-person field team, but despite intensified on-site investigation over a three-week period, no connections could be found between these two groups of patients. We then asked CDC to perform whole genome sequencing. And while we were awaiting those results, another adult TB patient, patient six, was diagnosed. This patient also had the same rare TB genotype as the other cases we were investigating, but no epilinks could be found for patient six. This neighbor joining tree shows a phylogenetic analysis of the sequencing results we received back from CDC. You can see that the TB isolates from patients one, two, and three are genetically closely related and are separated by only one to two SNPs. The isolates from patients four and six are genetically distant from each other. They're separated by a total of 34 SNPs. The isolates from patients four and six are also genetically distant from the isolates of patients one, two, and three. We then added the epidemiologic link data from the investigation to the phylogenetic tree. We did this by circling the nodes representing cases with epilinks to each other. To help us analyze the results, we also added patient five to the diagram. Recall that this was a clinically diagnosed pediatric patient who had no TB isolate to sequence and who was epilinked to adult patient four. After overlaying epi data to the tree, we analyzed and interpreted all of the available data to understand transmission dynamics in the suspected outbreak. As you can see in the bottom left portion of the tree, we found that sequencing results 
corroborated the already known transmission links between adult patient 1 and pediatric patients 2 and 3. You can see that the TB genome from the two pediatric cases differ by only one SNP from the TB genome of the adult source case. This tells us these cases have TB that's genetically closely related and consistent with recent transmission. Importantly, sequencing results showed substantial genetic distance between these two groups of cases, the ones at the lower left and the upper part of the tree. This much genetic distance means it's unlikely that these two groups are part of the same chain of recent transmission. We had looked hard for an epilink between adult patients 1 and 4, but never found one. This left us concerned we had missed a connection, potentially a drug-related link, and had potentially failed to identify an important transmission location or other contacts who were at risk for TB. We and county colleagues were relieved to learn that sequencing results corroborated the epi investigation finding that there was no link identified between these two adult patients. We could stop looking for a recent transmission link because one did not exist. We were also happy to learn that patient six on the far right side of the tree had TB that was genetically distant by 34 SNPs from the other adult patients. Patient six is also on the other side of the most recent common ancestor, meaning that case had distinct SNPs that no other cases in the genotype cluster had, further indicating patient six is unlikely to be related to the other cases by recent transmission. We are then able to exclude patient six from the investigation. To summarize, Sequencing results showed two separate chains of limited recent transmission. Sequencing also corroborated the initial finding that patient one was the source case to two pediatric patients. This information helped the program focus on efforts on ensuring that each adult patient had a complete contact investigation rather than also trying to find links between patients that did not exist. As for the public health outcomes of the investigation, we identified additional high priority contacts, intensified follow-up of contacts to ensure complete evaluation and treatment. We helped the local health department develop a protocol for using the new short course regimen for treating TB infection. And we helped provide patient interviewing and contact investigation training to the new local health department staff. It's important to recognize the limitations of our analysis. No SNP thresholds have been formally validated as a gold standard for identifying cases likely linked by recent transmission. While our experience to date suggests the SNP thresholds we use were concordant with epilinks or lack thereof, a more formal analysis and reporting of those concordance data would be another study. Sequencing results were generally not available early in the investigations we've described. Most sequencing results were analyzed mid-course or retrospectively. The good news is that we're already seeing that the turnaround times are improving as lab capacity for TB sequencing and phylogenetic analysis continues to expand. Analysis methods are also becoming more automated, which is speeding up turnaround times. I hope that we've helped describe how the combined analysis of clinical, epi, and phylogenetic data can help focus TB investigations. Sequencing results can help us make sure we're barking up the right tree by enabling us to more precisely identify outbreaks and outbreak cases. Importantly, these data can also help us avoid unnecessary investigations of clusters with cases not linked by recent transmission.